Today is the last video in my CNC with me series where I take the files included with the introduction pack to CNC with me and I walk through the end to end process of generating toolpaths, cutting those projects out and hopefully proving how easy it is to get into this CNC hobby. If you are interested in the CNC with me program, I will leave a link down below in the description. In the interest of full disclosure, I have no affiliation with Hamilton or CNC with me, but I did pay my own hard earned money to become a community member. So you can connect with me there as well as hundreds of other CNC nerds. In my last video, I ran through the detailed process of bringing an SVG into Carbide Create, creating the tool pass, exporting those tool pass to my Onefinity CNC, and creating this amazing little catch all. Now we had a few hiccups along the way, but in the end, we created this catch-all without too many problems. In the first video in this series, we did the exact same thing with Fusion 360, where we created this catch-all. I didn't have any hiccups with that particular project, but that's how things go with CNC. I will leave links to both videos down in the description if you're interested in checking those out. Today we are going to wrap up the series by reproducing these projects using Inventables Easel, but applying some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to the computer where I will get into Easel and we'll get on to making. Here we are in Easel. It is a website. You just go to the URL easel.inventables.com. You log in, you create a new project, and this is the screen that you will see. To start off things, we're gonna do a quick walk through the user interface here. So what you have on the left-hand side is a toolbar with a couple different interesting things we'll get to in a minute. In the sort of center left here, we have the canvas, which is where you draw all of your vectors. And then on the right-hand side, by default, we do have a 3D rendering of what you draw on the left-hand side. You can uh, drag the viewpoint here back and forth if you want, or you can use little, these little arrows right here and here to collapse it left or right. On the top right hand side, this is where you set your stock size and your bits, and we will get to that in just a minute. Then on the bottom here, you do have the opportunity to create multiple sheets. This is an advantage over Carbide Crate, in my opinion. You can have multiple versions of your vector here with different tool paths on it. And so that's something that I find useful, especially when I'm doing inlays, that you really can't do in Carbide Crate, which is limited to a single design. All right, so real quick, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna set our stock size just like we've done in the past. And so the default here is birch plywood. We are going to scroll down and find uh, something maple-ish. Let's see, hard maple, perfect. That's exactly what we want. And then we know that we want it eight by eight because that's what we've been working with in the past. And then the thickness here was uh, 21 millimeters. And so I'm gonna type in 21 millimeters. This is something that I also found interesting that Fusion does and Easel does, but Carbide Crate does not do. If I type in 21 millimeters, it automatically creates it, uh, turns it into inches uh, or whatever the units are that you have. So Carbide Crate didn't do that. And I found that a little frustrating, and a little annoying because I had to manually compute it, but it is what it is. In this lower corner here, you can see that you can select between the front left corner or center. If you remember, Fusion has a lot more options and Carbide Crate had more than this, but less than Fusion. So that's just something to know, but you can select center if you wanna do that. And really, I really only ever use front left or center. I don't use any other position. So these two, in my opinion, are simply just fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to click up here in the toolbar and we're gonna dismiss this by clicking right there. And then the next thing we wanna do is we wanna import our SVG. So I'm gonna collapse this guy just like that. So we have more real estate. We're gonna go under project, import SVG. We're gonna select our dog foot SVG as we've done before, and it's gonna import it. Now, you will notice that for some reason, both Fusion 360 and Carbide Create imported it in the proper size. Easel does not. I don't know why, I haven't been able to figure it out. I think it might have something to do with the uh, DPI that it was saved at, um, but it's hard to say. But the good news is, is this is super easy to fix. What we need to do is go over here to where it says shape and size. Make sure the little lock icon is locked so you maintain that aspect ratio. And then we're gonna type in eight. 
and we're gonna, I just hit tab or you can press enter and it automatically resizes it to eight inches. Now it looks like here that it can be a little bit bigger than eight inches, which is interesting because in theory, our stock is eight by eight. I guess that's because there is a border in the SVG. So I'm gonna go ahead and bump this up. Let's say 8.25. Okay, now the other thing you can do here is you can say select center to material. That makes it a lot easier to put things right in the center. The next thing with easel, what it does is it automatically assumes that you want to do a profile path on everything that you import, which is a little annoying because we don't want to do that but it's easy to fix. So what I'm gonna show you here is I'm gonna deselect all of these. I am going to first select the outside ring. For this first operation, we do not wanna cut that outside ring. We wanna cut those pockets first. So the way you have to do this in easel is you select cut here, and then you change your cut depth to zero. That is how you tell easel that you do not want to cut a specific vector. And you can see that it is sort of, whoops, you can see here, if you zoom in, it is still there on the screen, but it is not highlighted, which means it's not going to be cut. So again, that's a little annoying. I wish it was like dotted or dashed or something like this, but it is what it is. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and select, uh, hit the shift key, hold this down and select all of these vectors so that we can create our pocketing path. Then over here, we want to change our cut right here where it says, uh, cut path. We want to click this and say clear out pocket just like that. And then we want to change our cut depth to that 15 millimeters that we used last time. There you go. Now by default here again it is chosen this eighth inch bit which is not what we want. So we want to change our bit. So we're going to click bit right here. And you can see there's a couple of pre-canned options. None of them are the bit that we want. Now there's a lot fewer bits here than there were in Carbide Create, but I actually think this user interface is a lot easier to use. It shows you a picture of the bit. It's not overwhelming. You don't have to select your machine. Uh, it's just very much more straightforward. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select other. It does allow you to use one other bit. <laughs> so we're gonna select that. We're gonna tell it that it is 0.75 inches in diameter and then we are going to click this guy right here. Now, the next thing that we need to do is we need to adjust our cut parameters because when we created that bit, I'm gonna use that in air quotes, uh, we didn't set any of those cut parameters, so we're gonna do that right here. And again, a difference between Fusion and Carbide and Easel is Easel has two fundamental modes. It's called automatic mode where they choose the feed and speeds for you. And then manual mode where you get to type in your own. So if you're just beginning and you don't know what you're doing, you don't know anything about feeds or speeds, automatic mode, way to go. It is very, very, very conservative. You will likely have success no matter what you do unless you do something completely um, inappropriate. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and click into manual mode because I wanna use the cut settings that we used in the last project uh, just to make sure that it is capable of doing it. So what we do is we click manual, we're gonna change that feed rate to 80, we're gonna change the plunge to 40, and we use point, we ended up at 0.125 if you remember in the last, um, whoops, if you remember the last project. So uh, there are a couple fill methods here where you have offset and raster and then Y axis, which is a pro feature. Um, and you do have the ability, if you have Pro, to do a ramp. Um, I do not have Pro. Uh, you do get um, five free Pros per month if you had purchased an X-Carve at one point in the past, or if you have an X-Carve. Uh, so I do have that option because I did have an X-Carve at one point, um, but we won't do that here because I want to compare and contrast to the same thing that we did in uh, Carbide Create. But you can see in Easel, even though you can ramp, you do not have very many options for ramping in terms of the uh, setup. You have a five degree and a 20 degree. So for something like this, I would probably do either one of these should be fine. I generally ramp at 20 degrees unless they're, I'm doing something special um, or around eight degrees. So five degrees in this case. So, all right. So we have our cut settings for our dog feet. That is good. Now, how do we add that next vector in? This is where things get just a little bit complicated in Easel. I'm gonna click this plus thing here to use an additional bit. So you click the plus, 
it's going to open that menu again and I'm going to dismiss I'm going to dismiss that window. So get the same window that pops up again. You can see the same bit selection. What you don't see here for some very odd reason is a one quarter inch flat end mill. You only see eighth and sixteen. That is super weird to me because a one quarter inch end mill is a go to end mill for everything. <laughs> so I am going to click other again and I'm going to type in 0.25 just like that. And then I'm going to select this guy. We're going to go to cut settings. And now you can see there are two panes in the cut settings window. There is one for what they call a roughing path and one for the detailed path. So typically this would be used for cutting with the same bit where you want to do an aggressive cut with your roughing and then a more a refined or a more nuanced cut with your detailed. In this case, we're just going to use two entirely different bits. I'm going to select manual here. I'm going to select uh, 80 again, 40, and then 0.125 again, and there you go. Now that we have that second bit set, I want to go ahead and select it, make sure everything's fine, it looks good. I am going to select that outside canvas that we did right here. And now with that one quarter inch bit set, I wanna say cut uh, outside shape path so we don't make the mistake that we made with carbide create outside shape path just like that and we want to set that set that cut depth at the 21 millimeters just like that boom there you go and you can see that it's cutting on the outside it's got that good relief now by default it does include tabs we are going to use the tape method again not to uh, pick it up and lay it down again so it doesn't break free and then we're going to unselect the tabs here and you can see that you have your tool paths so if we click uh, over here, and we bring this, uh, this arrow thing back, we see our 3D. I'm going to slide this guy. There you go. All right, so here is our 3D rendering. If you want to see if, what your toolpaths look like, you click on the Simulate button here. It calculates the toolpaths very quickly. And it looks like what we have is pretty good. So I think, yeah, so we got our cuts here they look pretty good and our profile okay so next how do we get this G code and we get it into the infinity now if you had an X carve here you could just literally click this button right here and say carve again I don't have one so I'm gonna go ahead and export the G code so I'm gonna select on project right here and it'll say right here download G code you can download the roughing pass or the detailed path uh, or you can download it as a zip file. So I'm going to go ahead and download the zip file so that I have both those files and then I will get those copied over to the Onefinity here. So let's go ahead and do that. One thing to note, it does allow you to also download the zip file of the project so that you have your final vectors and the settings you used for your vectors. What is interesting to me, there does not appear to be any way to re-import that project into Easel. You can share this project with people and you can publish it to the Easel website, but you can't send a pre-zipped file to folks and have them import it. They have to manually recreate all of the toolpaths from the SVG that you download. That is something that I think that Inventive Goals could do a little bit better. This is uh, it's just a little dumb to me that you just can't re-import a project. But I guess if you want to send it to someone, then sharing it would be fine. However, if you want to say post it on a website and allow people to download it, then that's a little bit more problematic. So um, here we are, it is what it is. We are going to download the zip of the G code right here and it just downloaded it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unzip that. I'm going to put it in the proper folder and then we're going to get that uploaded to the Onefinity. So stand by. All right, so I've taken the zip file, I've unzipped it, I have created a folder on my computer here where I have the two files uh, detailed in the roughing. By default, Easel will name them, whatever you name the project in, in the website. Now, we didn't do that during our little tutorial, uh, so I wanna switch back and show you how to name the project so you have something useful. If we click back into Easel here, you will see here under project, it says untitled here. We can just click this guy and say, dog paw 
and close. And now you will see that it automatically renames it. One of the beauties of Easel is it automatically saves it as well. And so if we were to re-download uh, that zip file, it would now name everything Dogpaw, which I find a little bit useful if you uh, have all these different projects in Easel like I do. All right, so we are gonna cut back over to the computer here, and uh, we are going to upload this to the Onefinity. We're gonna make the cut, and then we will be right back to show the results. Here we are on the Onefinity controller. I have just homed and then zeroed in the lower left corner. So we're gonna go ahead and press forward with uploading here. So you can see we still have the uh, contour from the last cut set. So I'm gonna select upload here. We are going to go into the folder where we have everything. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is select the roughing pass. Remember that was the three quarters of an inch bit. We have one finity here. The render looks pretty good. Although this looks like a profile now that I look like it. Now that I look at it, we need to go back into easel and check. This is the beauty of rendering and just some mental cues that if you are not familiar with the process, over time you will just learn when things just don't quite add up. And again, this is the gloriousness of the Onefinity controller that shows you that rendering. I did not, I saw it on the screen here, I did not notice it. But what you can see here in, in easel, the toolpaths in the render here are different colors. You have a light blue here and a dark blue. I did not visually pick up on what that meant is those are the two different bits for the roughing and the detailed. That's not what we want. All right, it looks like in easel to separate these tool paths, we need to create a whole nother sheet, which is super unfortunate, but we will do that. So I'm gonna select plus here, eight by eight maple, we're good to go. I'm gonna select all, I'm gonna copy, I'm gonna paste it here. So they are in identical locations. I am gonna now Get rid of that second bit over here. I'm going to get rid of the second bit here. I am going to select this guy, change the cut depth to zero. So now we have just the pockets. Let's do our simulate here. Okay. That looks good. Okay. Then over here, I want to change this bit to be five cut settings look good I want to however I want to select these guys change the cut depth to zero so now we just have the outline all right so I figured it out I think uh, it's not optimal but it is what it is so what we have here are two separate drawings I took the original drawing I copied it onto the second drawing so it's the same size same location I have created the first drawing, which is this pocket operation with the three quarter inch bowl bit. Now, if I select this right here, you can see that we are cutting at that 15 millimeter depth. And you can also see that in a 3D rendering, we are not cutting all the way through. So we go to the second sheet here, right here, you can see that we have, it's cutting all the way through. We are using a quarter inch end mill. Um, that is what we want. So what I wanna do is I wanna go here, I wanna, uh, click this little down arrow right here and say rename and I want to call this uh, pocket 0 0.75 there you go and then I want to select this guy select the down arrow and say rename and I want to say contour 0 0.25 rename now let's go ahead and re-download the uh, G code let's gener simulate it first just to make sure we have everything in about two minutes about four minutes okay project let's say download g code so now it downloaded just the pocket g code select here download g code now it downloaded just the contour g code so let's go ahead and let's get those moved over to the right location so what we have now is we have those original files, which are not correct. And we have our new contour 25 and our pocket 75. So I am going to rename these to be dog paw pocket and dog paw, oops, paw contour. There we go. I am going to delete these two. Now I am going to take the pocket 
I'm going to upload it to the OneFinity user interface right here. Upload Pocket 75. Let's do that. Okay. All right. That looks better. That's what we were looking for. So what clued me off last time is these little rings in the center didn't exist in these three paws, but it existed here. I'm like, wait a minute, something's wrong. Uh, and anyway, so we got it fixed. So let's go ahead. Let's cross our fingers that it's going to do what we want. And we're still zeroed. We got green across the board. So, all right, let's give this a twirl. Let's do some cutting. So what I just did right here is I put the bit on the corner, the lower left corner, as we set in our tool pass. I have uh, zeroed the machine on the Onefinity controller for X and Y. And now I'm going to put in the real bit that we're going to cut with, and we're going to zero the Z. Now the reason we did not zero with this bit, because uh, there's really no good way to find the center of this bit. So I love using this sort of a uh, B cutter here to set the X and the Y, and then we can set the Z with this larger three quarters inch bit. So. All right, just something to notice here, which I think is interesting, and hopefully it'll come out on the camera. Uh, the surface finish here on the side for the easel is a lot worse <laughs> than either of the ones in the past. You can actually see visible lines where the bit was going down, and then the bottom cut is just ever so slightly on the outside than it is in all the rest of them. It's like it's progressively getting wider. Now, Typically, I would say this is a machine problem, but insofar as I've done two of these already and I didn't have this problem, uh, it's almost like there's something Easel's doing. I don't know. I'll have to look into it at some point in the future. And then the, uh, it occurred to me as well that I didn't get a chance to set the step over for this bit. There was no option to do so, and so there's a little ridge right here. But everything else looks pretty good. Well, we are back from our adventure with Easel and we have the finished product, which is right here. And I think it looks amazing. I actually think it turned out the best out of all of them. And I will talk about why. So first, right off the bat, I just wanna say that I did have some surface finish issues on the side with Easel. I don't know why. These cut settings were the same as Carbide Create and we use the same machine and we use the same bit. So the only thing that I could figure is I think the bit might be getting a little bit dull. And so I got a little rough surface finish here. So I did spend a little bit extra time sanding this one over the rest of them. And so that's just something to be aware that, you know, everything could be the same in your projects, but you suddenly start seeing a lower quality cut, then I would certainly look at your end mill. But because we cut this a little bit deeper than we did with the Fusion project, we were able to do these roundovers and it just gives it a much nicer finish. It's softer. It looks better than the one with Fusion, which is right here. And so hopefully you can see that. This is a very sharp corner. It's actually rough to the touch. And so uh, when you do the round over like I did, it just, it just looks better. Now you can see they look nearly identical from the outside. Uh, we have the same width on the, the sides here. We didn't have that issue that we had with Carbide Create. 
So I think it worked out very well with easel. Now comparing and contrasting what we got from easel versus carbide create. As you can see, we had that issue with carbide create where the webbing was a little bit thinner because we cut on the inside instead of the outside. And so comparing them, I, I think that something in between might be the best option. This is a little bit thick. I noticed it when I did the one for Fusion, but this I think is also a little bit thin. So, but I don't dislike either one of them. So I think either one might be the way to go. And I think it might be personal preference, uh, your personal preference or your customer's personal preference. But at the end of the day, this one definitely, I think, turned out the best out of all of them. A little extra sanding, a little extra care and attention to the finish, and it turned out the best in my opinion. All right, so real quick, I just want to say if you are getting value out of this video, please consider hitting that like button or maybe even subscribing, but no pressure. So quickly comparing the three programs in the ease of use. Certainly Fusion is a higher end program. It has more features, it has more details, and it is harder to learn. On the exact opposite side of the spectrum, Easel, I think, is the easiest to get into, to understand, to use, and to really get up and running quickly. It has the least number of options, the least number of configurations, uh, and so by that metric, it makes it the easiest to use. So in the middle, we have Carbide Create. Carbide Create lets you do things easier, uh, like multiple tool paths for multiple bits than easel, uh, but it doesn't have some of those sort of advanced features that you get with Fusion, like ramping, for example. So by that metric, it's really your choice where you want to start. I would recommend if you have no experience with CNC, definitely start with easel. You will probably very quickly outpace its skills and abilities uh, and then move up to something next. You can move up to Carbide Create. You could branch out into something like Vetric or Carveco, for example, or even you can jump into Fusion. But uh, as you get more advanced in your skills, you will need more advanced capabilities. And so you just want to move into software that meets your needs. Now, I always recommend starting with something that is low or no cost before you go out and buy a big expensive CAD or CAM software package. And I make that recommendations for two reasons. First, when you're getting into the hobby, it can be very expensive. You've plunked down a lot of money on a machine. You're getting hit with all these extra costs like bits and tool setters or, or you know, clamps and all this other stuff. And so, you know, plunking down another couple hundred dollars for a piece of software is not necessary you can get started with the free software. But the second, and I think the more important reason to recommend using some free software is because many of the free programs are just simply easier to use. The paid software are generally more complicated. They are intended for higher end users and whether that is a production workflow in a production shop or someone who is, has a very successful side hustle, for example. So uh, by that metric, Again, I think the free versions have come a long way. When I first started, there was essentially nothing free that was usable. And so now there are plenty of options and I'm excited about that. So the last thing I just wanna say about Easel versus the rest of them, certainly I had some issues getting Easel to do what I wanted it to do. We had to break that design up into two separate sheets and configure it with two separate bits entirely. That is a little bit odd. I don't ever remember having to do that in the past, but perhaps I did. So I would like to see a little bit more flexibility from Inventables on that one. But nevertheless, again, I still recommend Easel because it is very powerful for a beginner. And the way that it represents the bits and you've got a visual cue there and you just click on them and you have that automatic versus manual mode, it's just very easy to use. And again, I just highly recommend it for anyone who wants to start. All right, with that, if you are interested in a direct head-to-head -head comparison of Easel and Carbide Create, then I encourage you to check out this video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired.